The doc has read my message. Ah, he's calling. <laughs> Dr. Lundell, are you there? Thank you. How are you? Wonderful. I'm going to ask our people if they can hear you because I'm putting you on speaker. Okay, people, I need you to tell me. Can you hear the doctor? Doctor, will you tell us where you're calling in from? I am calling in from the great city of Spanish Fork, Utah. Awesome. I'm going to wait for you guys to comment. Can you hear him? I wonder if I can put the phone closer to the speaker. I need your guys' comments. I need your feedback or else I can't know. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Good. They can hear. They can hear. Woohoo! Let's rock and roll. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. I knew we'd find a solution. Well, and I my hair just for this broadcast, too, so I didn't even need to worry about that, right? No, yeah, not at all. <laughs> How great. Well, we are so grateful for your time here with us today. Why don't you give us a brief background of how you got into functional medicine and where your passions lie? Well, thank you. Yeah, excellent question. My wife and I, we've been married for going on uh, for 27 years now. And we, uh, for the first probably 10 years of our marriage, eight years of our marriage, we couldn't get pregnant. And so, that was very frustrating, but it led to some incredible blessings because we adopted three amazing kids through that whole process. But that, going through that whole process got me really thinking about what can we do differently to help restore health to my wife and her body and help her just be the healthiest person that she could be. Because she always would say to me, I feel like I'm just a lemon. And, and I was like, no, 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 we just need to make sure that we make sure and give your body exactly what it needs so that you can be healthy. And so that's kind of what started my journey as it was like, there's got to be things that her body's missing out on that, there, that she wasn't getting, whether it was through her diet or sleep or stress or exercise or hormones. And so that's kind of what started me down this journey to uh, head down this pathway. And then as we did, as we started to restore her health and she just started feeling so much better at the age of 41, just out of the blue, she got pregnant with our first homemade guy. And then again at 43, got pregnant with, uh, with our second homemade guy. <laughs> and so it's just been a great, amazing journey. Wow, beautiful. Age 41 and 43, that is just truly miraculous. So your, your passion is in truly looking at food as, as medicine, quite frankly, and really getting to root causes of conditions, right? Absolutely. It's like I tell my patients all the time that uh, food is medicine and medicine is food, but we, I, I always talk to them about how food speaks to your DNA, and it's this whole concept of epigenetics where if you eat the right kind of food, you can downregulate disease and risk for cancer and improving hormone production and improving mood. And, uh, yeah, so it's amazing when you can get people to change the way they eat. I think they're always surprised uh, how much better they feel. Right. Yeah, it, it is very surprising. Well, today we're going to really focus on thyroid issues. We've got a lot of viewers here, people who've sent in questions. So I would like to start out with one of our questions that had to deal with the causes of hypothyroidism. And her question, while I'm pulling it up, had to do with very specific uh, tests. She's wanting to know if there's a certain test she needs to run to rule out or to identify what the cause of this is, because if she can treat that root cause, she would like to. What would your recommendations be for her? Yes, well, you know, most of the time when you go to get a thyroid test done with your doctor, what they'll check is just uh, like a TSH. And I'm sitting here in my office, and I'm looking out my window, and the equivalent I draw of that is like, you see these cars going up and down the road, they look like they're running okay, and that's basically what a TSH is. Yeah, your, your car looks like it's moving. Um, but it doesn't say anything about how the motor's functioning and if it's efficient and if you, you know, if you're doing the very best you can. And so in order to do that, I dig in and we check some other labs that are really important. And so the first one would be a free T4, and that's like putting gas in the tank of the car. Okay. And, and then a free T3 is like put, getting the gas to the engine. And so you got to check those two labs plus 
can also put your car in reverse. And there's actually a lap called reverse T3. And that actually slows your thyroid down and you're making more of the reverse T3. So I check all of those things just to see what the full functioning of your thyroid is. Plus, you have to check thyroid antibodies, in my opinion. And that is where you look and see if your own body is trying to attack and kill your own thyroid. And that's a condition called Hashimoto's. Wonderful. So if somebody has had all of these tests done, but still doesn't feel like they were maybe prescribed the right medication, is, I guess my question is kind of two-sided, because is there fallibility in the prescriptions that are being given to people with such a widespread epidemic? And secondly, how do you know if you have been prescribed the right dosage and the right thing for you? Yeah, great question. In fact, you know that uh, levothyroxine is the number one prescribed drug in the world, which is a thyroid medication. So it's uh, very prevalent, and uh, it's even more common in women. So women that, that have thyroid conditions, typically about 90% of the time, they will have this condition called Hashimoto's, but no doctor's ever checking for that. And, and then when they do, they don't really know what to do about it anyway. Uh, and so levothyroxine, is the equivalent of putting gas in the tank of the car. But it doesn't say anything about whether it's getting to the engine. So most of the time, women will be prescribed levothyroxine, which is T4, and then they never get the lab checked on their T3 to see if it's actually being going to the engine, so to speak, that it's actually converting over to the active form of thyroid hormone. So, yeah, it's like... People are prescribed these medications, but then I don't really feel like it's being managed properly as far as the laboratory testing. Hmm. So you're saying that they're being prescribed something based on a basic standard test. I'm assuming that's just the, the TSH rather Correct. than checking for deeper tests, which would be some of these things like reverse T3, the antibodies that would determine if, help me finish that sentence, if, what are we trying to determine? Yeah, if the, if the medication actually is being converted into a form that your body can use. Okay. So that's why I, that's why I prefer uh, other medications to levothyroxine. Like I prefer something like an armor thyroid or a nature steroid because what that is, it's, it's natural desiccated thyroid, but it comes from the thyroid gland of a pig. Uh, but it has 80% T4 and 20% T3, so you get a combination of a little bit of both. And a lot of times when you just switch people to that prescription medication, they just feel so much better. Interesting, and that's called a desiccated hormone, is that correct, or am I wrong? That, that's correct, yep, you got it. Okay, great, so what do you think is holding people back from switching to a desiccated hormone? I know the dosing is very different in terms of the micrograms and such, but do you think people just don't know about it? and they're just listening to what their doctor says, and that's what their doctor prescribes? Uh, 100%. And okay. or even going through med school, I didn't even know natural desiccated thyroid existed, and I didn't go, to med, I didn't go through med school not, not too long ago. And I came out, and I still remember learning about it for the first time when I was, had finished residency and everything, and I asked one of my uh, a colleagues, I said, hey, do you ever prescribe this armor thyroid? And he goes, what's that? So my point is doctors aren't even being even instructed that there are these other options for the thyroid prescription, which is really fascinating. So when patients go and bring it up with their doctor all the time, they're like, oh, no, no, that, that can't be good. But mm -hmm. in reality, it's just they don't really know about it, which is the, the sad part. Very interesting. That's why they need to come visit someone like you. Uh, we just got the question about the difference between bovine and porcine. Did I even say that well, right? The one, uh, yeah, so the one that's prescription-wise is usually from a pig. Okay. So it's usually porcine, and that's the one that we prescribe. And interestingly enough, there used to be a lot of different prescriptions on the market, like Nature Droid, WP Thyroid, um, uh, Wet and Droid. But those companies all just kind of got shut down by the FDA wow. because they have done research. So the only one that's available right now is the porcine one, which is from a pig, and it's called Armor Thyroid. But that's my preferred one anyway. So, I mean, if people are going to take it, I, I would kind of prefer they take that anyway. Okay, great. 
Um, and I'm sure this is very case by case, but is there a general description you could give us of when someone is switching from a synthetic version to a desiccated hormone? Um, is there going to take some time to find that right dosage or can we usually get them feeling pretty good pretty quickly? Yeah, you know, if you've been on a T4 like levothyroxine synthroid medication for a long time, women typically come to me and they say, I don't feel like it's working at all. You know, and they'll say, it kind of felt like it worked a little bit at the first, but I feel like it's not working at all. And so usually when we switch them to a combination prescription medication, they typically go, wow, I felt so much better almost immediately. Um, and then what we would do is switch them, uh, and then over an eight-week period, you have to come back in and recheck a blood test to make sure that, and of course, check the right lab test, right, so that we're yeah. checking all the right stuff and make sure we're in the, in the numbers that we're looking for. Great, excellent feedback there. Let's talk about the connection and maybe some of the initial causes of hypothyroidism. I've read a lot about the connection to the adrenal glands and uh -huh. especially high cortisol. So talk to us about potentially some of those things that we're all doing, maybe even if we don't have a thyroid issue or if we do, uh, that potentially could be either aggravating this or causing it. Yeah, so this is where I get a ton of uh, uh, ladies that come and see me from all over the world. I do Skype and, and FaceTime consultations with people because I talk to women about this all the time. When they have low thyroid, most of the time, the doctor has never checked to see if they have Hashimoto's disease. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time when the thyroid is not functioning properly in women, it's their, if they have Hashimoto's. And Hashimoto's, again, is an autoimmune condition where your body is attacking your own thyroid and trying to kill it. So then what we really launch into at that point is, well, why is your own body trying to kill your own thyroid, right? And there's three things that have to be in place. And this is what I talk to women, to talk to ladies about all the time. Okay. The first one is you likely have some sort of genetic predisposition for your body to attack your own thyroid. And it doesn't mean that they, your mom had to have Hashimoto's. She could have had some other autoimmune condition. So number one is genetics. Number two are these things I think that you're referring to, Chris and Joe, which is the, um, the environmental triggers. So it can be stress and it can be sleep and it can be eating the wrong kinds of foods that you might have food sensitivities to. It could be environmental toxins. It could be our makeup, our pollutions, plastics, pesticides, things that we're exposed to in our food. Um, it could be stress. Um, it can be hormonal changes. It can be birth control pills. So these are some of the triggers that can kind of trigger your genetics in that, in that regard. And then the third component is people typically have a problem with their stomach. They usually have a condition called leaky gut because that's where most of your immune system is in your gut. And so, again, if you're eating food or you have the wrong kind of uh, bacteria in your stomach or you have candida or yeast overgrowth in your gut, then it's going to lead to leaky gut and it will lead to this continual attack upon your own thyroid. Wow. Sounds scary. <laughs> But, Sorry, that was, that was a mouthful. <laughs> no, no, that's that's wonderful. So we, we see that things are connected, the gut, the adrenal glands, the thyroid. You mentioned briefly in that about some of the foods that maybe we're eating that are not helping us, and so some of those foods to avoid. So before we go into just in general, maybe some of those foods that are causing some less than favorable outcomes in our body, can we talk about specific foods to avoid for those with hypothyroidism? And then I would like to go into um, just generalized nutrition. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And what I have, uh, what I have the ladies do that come and see me is I actually step them through an elimination diet. So we'll take them off foods like of course, sugar and gluten and dairy and corn, soy, peanuts, shellfish, and eggs for a period of about four weeks. It takes about four weeks for people to calm down the immune system to particular foods that they're eating. Um, and then after that four-week period, I have them reintroduce each of those foods one at a time over about a three, four, or five-day period. And then they sort of pay attention to how they feel, what their sleep patterns are like, if they're getting headaches, if they're getting stomach aches, if they're getting joint pains and stiffness, if these things start to come back, then you can kind of learn that these are the foods that are the most inflammatory. 
inflammatory for you and that are triggering your condition the most. And those are foods that you probably need to stay away from and avoid. Fantastic. So definitely an elimination period. Um, do you have anywhere uh, a, a place that people could maybe get a list of that? Or is that something they should just schedule a time with you? Like you mentioned, you do Skype appointments. You can work with anyone in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Is that the best way to really get that elimination uh, process? Well, yeah, but I think you could also go online and just like Google search things like an, an elimination diet. You'll get some really good resources for sure. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so no, I think there's some really good resources out there for people to be able to, to do an elimination diet. And the other thing that you can do, which I think is really fascinating, and this is just kind of my own personal preference, because I do this myself, mm -hmm. is that you can check, uh, you can get your doctor to prescribe for you a glucose meter. So a finger stick, you know, glucose meter that you can just keep at home. Yeah. And what we typically find is that if you're on the elimination diet, you'll find that your blood sugars will get better under control because your inflammation is coming down. And then, and you'll you'll find that your body will get into a pattern of a certain number for blood glucose that will be pretty consistent. And then if you introduce a food that you have some sensitivities to, you'll notice that your blood sugars will start to spike up a little bit higher than they have in the past, have over the last four weeks. Yes. And then that's another clue as, as to the fact that you probably have a sensitivity to that food. Okay, that's a great suggestion. So I just wrote that down for everyone on our whiteboard that can see me, glucose meter. Now we did get a question from Desiree. She says, I can't find a doctor to prescribe porcine and can only find bovine online. My free T3 was almost zero. I was previously on porcine in New Mexico, but cannot find it in Texas. Do you have any advice for her? She can find me here in Utah. <laughs> Utah's where it's at, everyone. <laughs> it's really Dad, I'm not gonna lie. Like I think that's why people come and see me from all but uh, different places because, again, most of these physicians have been trained to prescribe only synthroid levothyroxine T4 only stuff, and so, so these poor ladies will go to like a different state, or they, you know, and then they can't find a doctor who will prescribe them. But yeah, the the, T, the free T3 is the very maybe the most important lab on there, and if, if it's not being addressed, people are gonna feel bad. Yeah. Now, can you prescribe to anybody in the U.S.? Or yes. yes, absolutely. Yep. All right. That's a big thumbs up for our watchers. Okay. I now would like to ask you about just generalized nutrition, and we can just. I think everyone knows. Yeah, we need to stop drinking soda. We need to not eat so much sugar. Uh, but is there anything else that perhaps is outside the box that we may not be thinking about that could make a difference for us? for just helping people feel better. Right, helping us feel better, um, let's say on the prevention side of, of uh, maybe thyroid thyroiditis or, or hypothyroidism runs in our family and yeah. we're, we're wanting to stay on top of it. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. Um, I, you know, gluten for me is always a concerning one for a lot of people. If you have a family history of autoimmune disease, gluten tends to be one of those unfortunate foods that tends to trigger people's autoimmune conditions sometimes more than others. So I think that's a big one to be really careful with. And then I think a lot of people go, when they go, well, you know, I'm not, I can't have sugar because I know that's super inflammatory. So then they'll go to some of these artificial sweeteners, which I think can be not great. They can be fairly damaging for gut bacteria, mm. uh, you know, things like Splenda. And you want to make sure you keep that good, ba good gut bacteria there because like we talked about, there's this connective piece with thyroid and the gut and oh and I was going to mention too that a good majority of your T4 medication or even just if you internally produce your thyroid hormone T4 is converted to T3 in your gut. Oh. So you want to make sure that your gut's super healthy and sometimes dumping a bunch of artificial sweeteners down there isn't the best yeah. plan. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. I, I see that out in the world. We, we justify, we create an emotional crutch often thinking, oh, well, at least I'm not doing sugar, yet we are putting those artificial sweeteners in our body in great amounts. So I think that's really key to hear you say that. Thank you. Uh, talk to me a little bit about radioactive iodine. That seems to be a common um, 
thing that different doctors or experts talk about is a deficiency in iodine, and I've heard both for and against radioactive iodine. So what, what are your thoughts on iodine for hypothyroidism or health in general? No, I think iodine, you know, clearly if you do high, high, high doses of iodine, like you're talking about radioactive 